Um, so, first of all, my, uh, my name is Steve Rebell, and I work, uh, I work for Element. I've been with Element for six years, uh, and I've been at PR for uh, 20 years. Uh, it's unusual for a PR person sometimes to speak in a journalism setting, uh, but uh, I'm flattered that I get, I get to do that. Um, so, my role at Element, uh, you can find me at stevebell.me or you can find me on Twitter at stevebell1l. Uh, but my role at Edelman is to think about what is the future of media uh, and to help our clients understand uh, what the, uh, the future is of reporting, distribution, and consumption of news and media content. And so as part of that, I talk to a lot of different people uh, and you know, try to compile a whole bunch of thoughts on what I do, uh, and listening just to kind of you know what what is I talk to reporters, I talk to our clients, I talk to our teams, academics, thinkers, and out of that try to parse out what it, where is media going. And I'm so glad that you know we're here to talk about sustainable journalism because uh, I think that's a that's a great topic. So what I'm going to share with you today is a is the first uh, distillation of a scrapbook of insights that I'll be putting together every month uh, that you can find on my site, where I kind of share what I've learned about how the media has evolved. And it's, uh, I think it's, it's rather than that. So let's start the, uh, the story. Uh, the story begins in 2008. Uh, and the conventional era back at that time was that the media as we know it was dying. So, I mean, the, the, the fall, everyone had the media pushing up, pushing up phases. That was, that was the, the conventional wisdom. Uh, and, you know, there was a lot to substantiate that. I mean, you know, newspapers were, were, were folding up. Uh, you know, some cities were going out, were going without a local newspaper. Uh, local TV news was having a tough time. <laughs> Uh, you know, obviously there were lots of buyouts in the press. Uh, the media was trying to erect paywalls and weren't quite sure how that was going to work. So, you know, 2008 is not that long ago, but, and it's easy for us to forget, but, I mean, the media was, you know, hurting in a significant way. And a lot of people were saying, well, social networking is killing the media, and, you know, Twitter is, uh, you know, time on Facebook, and Twitter is killing the media, and blog, you know, in certain sectors is, uh, is doing a lot of damage. And you know, it got so bad that one uh, enterprising guy on Twitter started a, uh, an account uh, called The Media is Dying. And it's attracted 25,000 followers. Um, and you know, I mean, that was kind of indicative of where we, uh, where we were uh, at that time. Well, let's continue the story. Funny thing happened on the way to the funeral. <laughs> uh, the media actually evolved and innovated. And I'm going to argue that they are now, uh, that the press is stronger than ever. The state of the press is stronger than ever. And, and not just, you know, whether it be entertainment or news content or feature content, uh, it's, it, it's amazing how much uh, it's derived. And there are, as I went and I looked around and talked to a lot of different people, I started to collect different things in my scrapbook and taste them up that I hadn't noticed before. For example, we're seeing blogs launch long form content vehicles. So Engadget, which got its start, you know, I think in 2003, you know, now publishes every week a, an iPad magazine called Distro. And it shows up in the newsstand and it just appears there. And it's free. And it's, it's a feature magazine about gadget news with columns and you know, the whole nine yards. Uh, Politico, another blog that has been extraordinarily successful uh, in, in Washington, has been equally <coughs> successful in publishing ebooks about the campaign. So these ebooks are published and they're distributed I think, through Amazon. Uh, and so we're seeing a, uh, a revitalization in, uh, in the long form content. <laughs> Uh, related, uh, we're seeing in television a renaissance taking place. You know, all the talk and 
you know, say 2008, 2009, was that you know, TiVo and DVRs were becoming TV. Well, at least becoming TV advertising. TV was still very strong. But TV advertising was starting to be less relevant because people were skipping ads on, on TV and DVRs. Well, a whole array of experiences, particularly on the iPad and the tablets, have revitalized television. It's let the networks play defense against DVRs. How? Well, these are what's called second screen apps. Uh, the folks at TV Guide counted them up, and there's like, I think, 100, last time I heard from them, there was 180 different apps for shows and networks. And all of them have a social experience. A lot of them don't even work unless the show is on. Yet, though I think the one for the X Factor, for example, <clears throat> has all kinds of experiences that are built into the app. And what that does is it forces you to tune into something that might be a recorded program at that time. This is a show around the show. There's things like Get Blue that have been very successful, as you see here, where people can collect badges uh, for checking in while they're watching the shows. And it goes on and on and on. And so the media has totally been reinvented in the last couple of years. The innovation has been dramatic. And from what we've seen, the payoff has actually been huge. Uh, we do a tracking study every year uh, called the Trust Barometer. You can find it at trust.edelman.com. We've been doing it for, uh, I think, a dozen years ago. And we ask all kinds of people who they trust. What, how, do you, how much do you trust the media? How much do you trust the government, executives? Uh, you name it. What kind of spokespeople do you trust? And this year, one of the most interesting findings was that you know, trust in media was, was strong. Uh, it was the only institution, when we look at government, NGOs, uh, corporations, to see trust rise globally. And more than 50% of the people we surveyed trust media. Now, you might say, gee, it doesn't sound that high. Well, it's rising. And it varies by country. You'll notice in, in Japan, lower because there's some skepticism around the, the coverage of the, uh, of, the, of the earthquake. So it, it changed, but that is a promising sign. Now I don't have data to support this, but my, my belief is that the innovation in media plays a significant role here in revitalizing uh, trust. So I started notice all this. And so last, end of last year, I set out on a journey. I said, okay, let me let me go find the smartest people I can talk to on the media side, as I mentioned earlier, analysts, whether they're editors or executives. Um, and yesterday I spent three hours over at, uh, at CNN learning all about the eye report and how they work. Um, or, you know, I, I spent uh, an hour and a half with the folks at CBS Local and heard about all the things that they're doing uh, last weekend. So I'm constantly learning. I'm only as smart as the people around me. I'm only as smart as the but I'm a good I'm a good curator. And so what I've done is I've kind of like looked out and see what's going on. What what's different now? What changed? How is the media operating differently if they were able to get their mojo back? And when I explored that, five rules emerged. <coughs> Five different rules emerge. I'm going to talk about those five uh, in, in the next few minutes. Um, and I'm sure there's many more. But these are different kinds of, as I, you know, the ability, the thing that I, I'm able to do thankfully is connect dots by talking to different people and hearing different things. And these are kind of the first five themes uh, that emerge around how I think the media has, has innovated back to uh, a much more healthier uh, and sustainable environment, which I think would be probably quite pleasing to the folks that are in this room. So um, I started my conversation uh, with a gentleman named Jim Bankoff. Anybody know Jim Bankoff? Uh, Jim is, uh, was formerly with AOL. And a few years ago, he had an insight. There's a lot of really good people 
that are blind to that sports news, and doing so with a lot of passion. So, you know, there is somebody in every city <coughs> that's blind to that in a professional sports team that is quote unquote an amateur journalist, and doing so quite well, and maybe does not have a way to monetize what they do. So he found all of these. He found the best bloggers in, you know, covering, writing about the Kansas City Chiefs, or about the Georgetown Hoyas, or about, you know, the, about the New York Rangers, or the New York Yankees. And he rolled them up into a network called Sports Blog Nation, or SBNation.com. And that has been a very, very uh, successful model. There's another site out there called The Bleacher Report that also does a similar kind of curation. And they've been successful. These sites, when you think about sports, it's one of the oldest interest verticals on the internet. I mean, it's almost as soon as like there were you know, connected computers, there was, a, there was a rush of you know media of sports media brands that moved in very strong. ESPN, Yahoo, I mean, Yahoo Sports is still one of the top uh, sports sites on the web. Very popular. Yahoo, I'm like yeah, no, it's, it's extraordinarily popular. It's one of their it's success. But these sites that curate from the crowd are nipping at the heels. They're now in the top. Both these are in the top ten uh, sports sites in terms of uh, in, in traffic. And I've met with Jim a couple of times, but he now is behind a, a tech site called The Verge. And The Verge, you know, think about tech blogs. There's a million. And you know they're all excellent. A lot of them are really good. But he's come in with this uh, approach called the Verge, where he went out and found <coughs> the best talent he could find, and created a new visual, uh, new visual style. Has his own kind of homegrown technology, and you know, he's still, you know, SBN and the Verge are still startups, but they are winning uh, through curation. And you know, if you think about sports, sources are now going direct. The players have their own mouthpiece. The teams, uh, you know, do a lot with social media, and so obviously it's easier than ever, you know, for somebody to theoretically sit at home and, and be a pretty good, you know, locator of information. And so, you know, the first thing I've noticed is that you, know, you can curate the document. That was the first, you know, rule I've noticed that curation, is, you know, is not a new idea. Uh, can thrive in an era where there's too much content and not enough time. And, you know, so you say, okay, sports. I, I get that. Um, but what about, what about breaking news? Well, I went and found uh, a woman at, uh, at MSNBC. Her name is Laura McCullough. And Laura uh, works for, a, uh, Laura works for a, uh, a website called App Breaking News. Anybody think App Breaking News on Twitter or BreakingNews.com? Uh, it has, uh, I mean, literally, you know, hundreds of that, you know, 3.5 million followers. Uh, and on, on a daily basis, they send 100,000 page views to news sites. They send 100,000 page views to news sites. They actually crashed the Atlantic news site uh, the other day. And what App Breaking News does is they go and they curate links from around the web faster than anybody else. They, you know, and they don't care where it comes from in terms of if they want it from a, a reputable source, or whether it's from AP or the New York Times or uh, you know, Vanity Fair or People, they curate links faster than anybody. And they put them out on their mobile app, on their, I don't know, push through mobile alerts, through their website and, and uh, Twitter. They have a presence on Google Plus, they have a presence on Facebook. So they're multi-platform, but they're fast, and they're 24-7. They do very little of their own report. It's almost entirely curated links. And they even have a whitelisted program where if there are certain uh, media outlets that they quote on a regular basis, they give them a special treatment of a whitelisted group. Reporters actually can tip them off they have interesting stories. Um, and so that's, you know, that's been a very successful model for them. There are other curators in places that you might not expect. Uh, I would like to introduce you to, to three gentlemen 
Uh, the upper right is uh, Vadim Lavrusik. He is uh, basically the ambassador to the journalist community at Facebook. Uh, next to him on the left is Mark Cogney, who came from Newsweek and is now a Tumblr. Um, and why do I like the name? Here we go. Uh, and the bottom is uh, Daniel Roth from, uh, from LinkedIn. And what they do is all these, you know, these are, they all work at social networks, but they all work with journalists to help them create and curate content on their platforms. And Tumblr may be the more interesting one here because they actually just this week hired uh, an editorial team. They, they hired a, a, an editorial team and the quote, the story was in the New York Times earlier this week, and what's really interesting is that the reason they hire, and, and what these reporters are going to do is they're going to write stories about what they find in Tumblr. So, and the justification behind that, which was, you know, when somebody said, well, isn't it just PR? Of course it is. But what they're actually going to do is they're treating Tumblr like it's a huge city, like it's a metropolis. And then they're going to look for the best stories that maybe are not being told and surface those stories. I found that fascinating. Uh, what Dan Roth does at LinkedIn is he's got a site called LinkedIn Today, where he basically handpicks and curates links from around the web in different verticals and rolls them up into LinkedIn Today for different interest groups so that real estate professionals can go and find the latest news, accounting professionals can find the latest news. Uh, and he does that by, by topic. That's a form of curation. And Vadim is, is working with new sites. Uh, the Washington Post has built a very successful curation site inside Facebook that is see, that they're seeing significant return on. So that, that's a change. The good news for journalists is that there's new places for journalists to find jobs in content-facing roles. And not just in the social network, but also in agency. We, our chief, we have a chief content officer, his name is Richard Saber, and he worked for the BBC for, for 20 years. Now he helps our clients create content. So that's a change. So this is all part of this kind of curation role. And then there are curators on top of the curators. Flipboard, Pulse, Zeit, these are all apps for, uh, for all the different tablets and smartphones. And what they do is, either by topic or by brand, make it easy for you to see content from around the web from all kinds of different sources in a very visual, compelling way. And those are pure play curators. So this is going to be a theme. Because again, the content vector is like this. More content will be created every single day. I mean, I think I read a stat that you know, more content is created every two days and is equal to this would have existed in the entirety before 2003. But the time vector, the amount of time you have for content, yes, grows somewhat because the second screen experiences and mobile devices fill pockets of time that we didn't have before, but your, your brain is still limited. And, you know, when Facebook consumes seven hours of time per user per month, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's huge then you know, there's going to be a need for curators to help us kind of, you know, find art and, and lead our job. Some of that will be human powered and some of that will be out, out of the power or mix. I think sport, sports block nation is, is, a, is a mix. So that's the first theme I chose, is that brands are becoming curators. Media brands are becoming curators. So let's continue. Um, I don't know about you, but I, I hate math. I, I'm, I'm averse to math. I, I, just, I never liked it. Um, but I've noticed that math in journalism is becoming uh, more prevalent now. Editors are actually doing more uh, to, uh, to do two things. They're data mining to find out what works well. And they're time. They're thinking about when they put out their content, and they're thinking about you know, how they kind of use data uh, to make smarter editorial decisions. Let me give you an example. Uh, there's a website called All Things Date. It's, uh, it's an offshoot of the Wall Street Journal, very popular tech news site. 
And I went out and met with uh, a young member of the editorial team. His name is Drake Martinet. And what Drake does, I mean, he writes stories. He's, he's a writer. But he, he's also kind of like the horse whisperer. He looks at data, all kinds of data, where the traffic is coming. You know, uh, what stories were most popular? What stories got the most retweets? What, what got the most shares on Facebook? Um, you know, what was in the headlines? You know, what site, what, what news stories are they getting the most traffic from from Google News or from Google or from Bing? And, you know, international versus U.S. Where is the, where, what, what signals are there in the data? And then he goes and he works with the editorial team and he serves as basically like a cat. He gives them advice on how they can take a story that was successful and maybe do five that are like it. The journalists still make their decisions based on news doubt, based on news judgment and all the training that they had you know, through the years. But now they are armed with data that makes it even that makes it even smaller. The Huffington Post has a traffic and trends team. And what they do is they mine what's, what, what the vibe is on the social web, they mine what the vibe is on Google through search data, and then they assign stories based on that. Very smart, it's a smart strategy. The Economist uses the platform called Social Flow. And let's say they got, they put 15 different stories on the web in the last, you know, six hours. They, they then look at Twitter data and they say, what, what topics right now are trending on Twitter? And when should, we bet, when should we put out our stories to make sure that they are, you know, when the tide is highest? Right? When do we get into the tide, you know, raises the boat? And, you know, the Business Insider has a website you can go see called the Engage Meter. You go on the Business Insider, it's on the right hand side. You can see in real time how many people are on the site, how many people are commenting versus reading where the traffic is coming from, what stories are most successful, most popular. They make that data available to the public. To see. But make no mistake, they're not alone. A lot of companies use the same tool, which is called Chartbeat, behind the scenes. A lot of media companies are doing that. So, I mean, so journalism is becoming more data mined uh, and taught. Um, there's a company called Storyful, that's run by this gentleman, or we see consultant called his name is Joe Webster. And you know what they do is they say, okay, look, there's all these great sources on Twitter, uh, primary sources. How do I find them? I don't have time as a journalist to go do that. So what they do is, like for example, today they look at Nevada and they say, who's on the ground in Nevada who is doing the best tweeting about the caucuses? And they roll them up into custom Twitter lists that they then sell and roll together for, to the media to use. They curate for the media. They help the media do their job better. They help them data them. And there's many more examples. There's a company called Narrative Science. And what they do, they, they've automated uh, the reporting of formulaic stories. So like earnings reports, right? They come out, you know, they, they have a, a Algorithm that goes through the press release, pulls out the earnings numbers, and helps companies like Reuters, for example, put the first you know bullet out about the earnings report. Sports roundups, you know, roundups about uh, you know games, wrap ups, who won, who lost, you know, how many goals somebody shoot, you know, how many baskets uh, somebody have. Also, formulaic writing that can be somewhat automated. Now somebody comes and checks all that, but you know that's where this is going. Data mining is big. So the second trend I noticed, the second thing I noticed is that data, that journalism and storytelling, while still remains at their pure a, uh, a human endeavor, are now more than ever data mining and time. They're using you know, big data to be smarter. All right, let's continue the story. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, content will scale, time and attention, and I started to notice that there was there's a kind of a raging war for page views that underpins almost every business decision uh, in, among anybody who does content. Everybody is fighting 
everybody, for every last paid view that you get. <coughs> they don't care where it comes from, they want views. Because paid views equals money. And they're using a whole array of uh, weaponry in that war, such as listicles, you know, lists as articles. You'll see this you know, throughout your day. You'll notice that there's more headlines than ever that have a, a numeral in it. You never would see that years ago. You know, slideshows. I don't know about you, but I've lost a lot of time to 15 celebrities that look too, <laughs> that look too flabby on the beach. <laughs> okay. I mean, I, you know, I can count I, the number of hours I've lost that. Or, or, you know, definitely you know, 50 looks for ball guys. I mean, that, uh, <laughs> spend a lot of time on it. But, uh, infographics, right? You're seeing them more than ever. Uh, so, uh, and, you know, infographics is funny because, you know, like, gee, infographics. Like Columbus came over and showed us the infographic. No, <laughs> you know it was like you know it was like it was you know USA Today you know 30 years ago, and I'm going to argue that that you know cavemen cavemen did a great job with infographics. Um, so you know and so I said okay what's going on? <coughs> what, what's going on? Why you know why is there all this kind of like you know eye candy and you know you know why are people seeming to do everything to you know to get traffic to their site? So uh, there's a guy. His name is Robert Scoble. He's a tech blogger. Uh, he's uh, you know he's uh, he's pretty influential. And um, I, I saw him out. You know, he said somebody I've known for about ten years now. And I said, look, I want to pick your brain because you're usually ahead of the curve. And so but this was in October, and I sat with him for like you know an hour, and all he could talk about was Facebook. All he was talking about, and Facebook had just made an announcement. Uh, the day before, around this technology called Open Graph, uh, where basically what they were going to do is allow companies to build all kinds of custom applications, either in their site or off-site, that when somebody used them, it would broadcast out to their friends that they used that application. So, for example, you may have seen in your newsfeed 15 people or 10 of their friends have read the following stories in the Washington Post or read the following story from The Guardian, or I'm sure you've seen so-and-so is listening to so-and-so saw it on Spotify. Uh, you'll start to see more of that now, too. They've opened up to more uh, applications last week or a few of them that launched. That, that you know, he stays on top of what's going on at, at, at Facebook. And so I noticed that companies were beginning to, do, were beginning to build social news experiences inside Facebook to get more pages to get more of their content distributed. And it's been working. The Guardian has seen a million more page views a month since they launched their social reading experience inside Facebook. These are immersive news experiences that you can find inside Facebook. Sometimes they're giving up uh, their own content. And so he pointed me towards this trend of verbs. He said, you know, these verbs read, watch, listen, that we're going to see in Facebook are going to be extraordinarily important signals for how people spot content. All right, that's what um, the folks at TV Guide uh, have built their own iPad application that has seen millions of downloads uh, and you know driving usage. And it's often used while shows are on the air, reinventing uh, the magazine, right? Reinventing the magazine. And then finally. Uh, this guy, Michael Lazaro, who runs, uh, who's CEO of a company called Buddy Media, uh, gave a speech at the National Media Conference. And he talked about how if you add a, a, sh a share functionality to a, a simple poll on your website, so you, you know, somebody has a poll, who do you think is going to win the Super Bowl this weekend? And you, know, you say, okay, you took the poll, now you can share that with your Facebook friends. A tiny, 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 tiny percentage of people will actually share that poll with their friends. That's logical, right? But it, that actually drives the amplification of traffic to that page by 13%. Because the, the, the math of Facebook takes up. The math of Facebook takes up. So we're seeing that people can, uh, can keep their stories alive longer. That's the next trend. Um, Next, I went to Hollywood. 
Hollywood is not exactly uh, known as a uh, you know, bastion of deep thought. <laughs> um, but uh, I was surprised, you know, when I went actually, they visited uh, the University of Southern California, the Annenberg School of Journalism. Uh, and I visited there on, on two different occasions. On one occasion, I met a, uh, a guy, his name is Jeff Fouché, he's uh, with the LA Times. And he's been there, I think, for 20 years. Actually covered gang murders uh, in the first uh, five years of his, uh, <coughs> his tenure at the LA Times. He, uh, he's always had a passion for science fiction. You know, science fiction movies and comic books and uh, you know, the, whole, the whole genre. And he convinced the LA Times uh, a few years ago to launch a blog called Hero Complex, which is devoted to, uh, <coughs> you know, to all things science fiction. He found a way to combine his love for words and movies uh, and do this kind of as his, as his full title. Yeah, that's been extraordinarily successful. They would have gone into a, a content genre and filled in a need that, that existed. People wanted to know more about science fiction and the connection to Hollywood. And he built that out as a very successful uh, content vertical for them. Um, you know, I mentioned uh, ebooks. Also, people are publishing more ebooks now and they're archiving their content. Uh, they're finding when Steve Jobs died. Forbes and Fortune, I think, went before when they found like the, the best articles were written on Steve Jobs. They rolled up the new book and they put it out in all the stores. At USC, I met another guy, Dr. Henry Jenkins. And he invented the phrase transmedia storytelling. That was his phrase. And this is his phrase. Uh, and when I was with him, he said that there's two planes of media. There's media that's spreadable, media that we snack on all day long. And then there's drillable media, media that goes into much more depth. And there's been this kind of revolution in long-form reading and long-form content. Look at, you know, think the rise of the Read It Later services, like Read It Later, this paper, Sprint is a document pop that it's in uh, its traffic for us. Uh, so he talked about spreadable media, and I think that that's what, what a lot of the focus has been about, like, okay, how do we get our stories spread all over Facebook? But also be drilled. So the other, the fourth trend I've noticed is that the media company is rolling in. They're rolling in the deep and they're doing uh, long form content more than ever, in, and they're filling in niches that didn't exist before. And that's a, that's a new trend. Uh, finally, uh, everything I, I know about life and business I learned from sports. That's probably not good, but uh, I've noticed that. And, but I, I've seen that, look, in the media world, the media world has always had parallels to the sports world. Where we have, you know, superstars. The video of a Yankees fan, huge Yankees fan. Uh, so, oh, and the blood, okay, all the Red Sox fans just got no, the room. Um, the very same, probably. Uh, but, uh, you know, there are superstars in sports. Now, they better, they're paid well, they better perform well, and they better help the team win champions. They also help build the cities. Let's face it. Baseball is a long and long season. It's a lot of games. And you know, you know, guys like this guy help uh, help fill uh, the seats. Media has always had the same model. Mike Columbus, you know, Thomas Friedman, you know, very respected, paid a lot of money. They you know they do their they, or they do their trade really well, but they also help attract traffic and and you know, the interest uh, in the brand. So they're like franchise players. They're there for often a very long time. But I've noticed that there's a crop of journalists that are young, hungry, and willing to break the rules either on their own or as part of larger media companies. Anybody know Brian Stelter, New York Times? He's a, uh, a writer who covers TV. Uh, and actually, in the documentary that came out of the New York Times, uh, you know, he was actually one of the featured characters in that movie. Um, he's been aggressive in using new media to build his brand, but recognizing every step of the way that he's only as relevant as the New York Times is. And he, you know, he very much values that relationship. And has been doing things like using Tumblr, for example. I mean, he was sent to Joppa to, to cover the uh, the aftermath of the tornadoes there. And you know, he 
again, there was no access to anything else, so he was using Tupper the whole, the whole way. And so more journalists now than ever are recognizing that they need to become personal brands. They can do so within the umbrella of their parent companies. Sometimes there's pain. Sometimes uh, the drama can look like, uh, like what happened with LeBron James when he went to go leave uh, the Cavaliers and go to the Heat. Uh, we've seen that. Uh, but sometimes it works really well. You, don't, you may have seen a site called Grantland that ESPN launched uh, you know, for Bill Simmons. It's an entire site where they let him kind of flourish and do his thing. Uh, you know, Selfish says that having a personal brand lets you punch above your own weight. And he's not kidding. So the media recognizes they need to cover their superstars. And it's working for them. And they need to, you know, if somebody grows their personal brand and they're, they're loyal to the organization, it can work well. So these were the five rules that I found. You know, you can, you can curate the dominant. You know, you can data mine and time the content. Um, you know, you need to do things, to look at the math and how you make the stories last longer. Things like Facebook can be very effective for that. Uh, be spreadable and be drilled. Got to be both. Got to have a short game and a long game. Uh, and then have superstar personalities. Now, all of these were about journalism. The same thing applies if you are a corporation and you're a brand. Same thing applies. If you can curate in a niche. There's no reason why you couldn't be a good content provider the same way the media is. Is it hard? Sure. But you can do it. There's no reason why you can't use data to be smarter about your, 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 everything from your, you know, your messaging to your, uh, to your public relations strategy to your, your marketing strategy. Uh, there's no reason why uh, you can't understand how to make your content last longer. Uh, being spreadable and drillable, definitely applicable in, a, in any kind of content. No content, but you know, there's all this focus in marketing and social media. I think people are going to start to get religious about going deep into more lawful content. You know, as I mentioned, corporations are hiring journalists in content based roles. And you know, there's personal brands inside organizations that, are, that have that, that kind of culture and allow that. So these rules apply not just for media companies, they were first to adopt them, but I think they apply uh, for marketers as well. So I'm not done. I mean, don't talk, but, uh, but I'm, not done, I'm not done learning. Uh, I'm going to continue to go over the all different kinds of people. I mean, I think one of the next trends I've noticed is that there's a, a blurring line between memes and news, between like internet culture and hard news. And BuzzFeed is, is a company that's reinventing that. BuzzFeed is reinventing, I think, they're going to reinvent journalism. And uh, I met with their CEO uh, a couple of weeks ago to try to understand where they're going. Uh, so you can find what I'm doing, uh, you know, I run, like I said, I'm going to put out these, uh, these briefings every month uh, at the Clip Report, which you can find at stevenbell.me. We trust data at trust.edelman.com. 